On the 10th of November 1975, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald just vanished off the radar screens of nearby vessels and disappeared without a word. Despite being one of the biggest ships on the Great Lakes, she managed to stay hidden for the better part of a week. Although she was later found, even today, we still don't know what really happened to her. Launched in 1958, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald was a 26,000 deadweight ton Great Laker. At 728 feet, or 222 meters in length, she was the first Seaway Max vessel ever constructed, making her the longest ship on the Great Lakes at the time of her launch. Seaway Max vessels are designed to be as big as possible while still capable of fitting through the canal locks on the St. Lawrence Seaway, giving them the potential of reaching the Atlantic Ocean. It's appealing from a commercial perspective, but it does give the ships a bit of an odd look, making them much thinner than their ocean-going counterparts. Edmund Fitzgerald, for example, had a beam of 75 feet, making her almost 10 times as long as she was wide. For the first 17 years of her life, she carried tassonite pellets, which is a form of iron ore, from Superior, Wisconsin to ironworks in places like Detroit and Toledo. Her usual route would take her across Lake Superior, through the Sioux Locks and down towards Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair and into Lake Erie for the final discharge. Over those years, she undertook approximately 748 round trips, covering over a million miles. On November the 9th, 1975, she completed loading her cargo of around 26,500 tonnes of tassonite ore pellets in Superior. As an ore, tassonite is quite a dense cargo, meaning that to make it float you need to displace substantially more volume than the ore takes up. This means that although she was fully loaded, inside Edmunds Fitzgerald's holds there was still plenty of empty space. Anyway, she departed Superior at 1415, en route to Zug Island near Detroit, Michigan. A couple of hours later, she joined another vessel, the Arthur M. Anderson, which was destined for Gary, Indiana. Together, they continued in a northeasterly direction, aiming for the Ontario shore to seek a little shelter. The National Weather Service was forecasting gales and storms in the area, so it made sense to head closer in where it should be a little better. Despite that though, early the following morning on the 10th of November, they did encounter a winter storm. Edmund Fitzgerald reported strong winds and 10 foot or three meter waves. By 2 a.m. that morning, the National Weather Service had upgraded their warnings from gale to storm, forecasting winds of 35 to 50 knots. The two vessels continued on, with the Edmund Fitzgerald now pulling ahead of the Anderson who'd slowed down to better ride out the weather. By the middle of the afternoon, conditions had deteriorated even more, with snow now also hampering visibility. The Anderson and the Fitzgerald, now only 16 miles apart, could no longer see one another. Shortly after 3.30 in the afternoon, the Fitzgerald radioed the Anderson to report that they'd lost a couple of vent covers and a fence railing, were taking on water and had developed a list. They were now running two of their six bilge pumps continuously to discharge water, so decided to slow down and wait for the Anderson to get a little closer. Around that time, the US Coast Guard radioed all shipping in the area to inform them that the Sioux locks were closed due to the weather and they advised seeking a safe anchorage. Fortunately for our two vessels, Whitefish Bay, in the southeastern corner of the lake, looked like a good spot. Before we get there though, let me just take a moment to mention this video's sponsor, Manscaped, the global leader for men's grooming and hygiene products. Over the holidays, they sent me their Performance Package 4.0, which includes the Lawn Mower 4.0 Trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to keep it all together. Now, when my kit arrived, my family thought it was hilarious as I'm usually quite rustic. Not out of choice I may add, but simply because I haven't found any gear that I could really get on with. It meant that I was really quite excited to get a new kit of precision engineered tools. Just look at the thought that's gone into them. The lawnmower has a smart cordless charging system with little LED lights on the front to show how much charge is left, and even a clever travel lock so that it doesn't start up in your bag when you go away. As for the weed whacker, well, I just had to get stuck in and see what their proprietary skin safe technology was all about. In my case, it lived up to its claims of reducing nicks, snags and tugs in those delicate nose holes. Although they sent me the kit for free as part of this sponsorship, I'm so glad they did because it's earned itself a permanent spot on my bathroom shelf. If you'd like to get your hands on a set, Manscaped are currently offering 20% off plus free international shipping, plus two free gifts if you use the promo code NAV at manscaped.com. Anyway, back to the Edmund Fitzgerald where they were doing okay until shortly after 1610 when their radars packed up. They asked the Anderson to help keep an eye out and assist their navigation using their radar instead. For a time, this worked with the Anderson directing the Fitzgerald towards the relative safety of Whitefish Bay. 
by late in the afternoon, other ships and monitoring stations had logged sustained winds of over 50 knots and the Arthur M. Anderson had logged them as high as 58 knots with 35 foot or 11 meter rogue waves. Around 7.10 in the evening, the Anderson radioed to check in on the Edmund Fitzgerald to see how they're getting on. The reply came, we're holding our own. Those were the last words ever received from the Edmund Fitzgerald. Around 10 minutes later, even the radar return was gone. The Arthur M. Anderson reported the Edmund Fitzgerald missing, but a combination of the weather, lack of vessels, and a lack of urgency meant that the start of the search was delayed. Overnight though, numerous surface vessels and aircraft joined, but they only recovered debris. None of the crew were found. A couple of days later, on the 14th of November, a US Navy Lockheed P-3 Orion anti-submarine aircraft detected a couple of magnetic anomalies at a depth of 530 feet, that's 160 meters. Side-scan sonar was quickly deployed, which revealed two large objects lying close together on the lake bed. It wasn't until May of the following year that the Navy managed to get a submersible down to the wreck and confirm it as the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. To this day though, the exact cause of the sinking remains unknown, but there are a number of theories. The first is that Edmund Fitzgerald suffered some sort of damage to the upper parts of her hull by some external floating object like a log. It's believed that this could have caused the loss of the fence railing and could have caused the vent covers to come free. This would have led to the ingress of water into the ballast tanks, which would lead to the list that they developed. The second theory is that Edmund Fitzgerald at some point accidentally ran aground and weakened her hull. It's argued that the reported loss of a railing could have been caused by the ship touching the bottom in the midship section and hogging. The tension along the deck would have caused the railing to break free and the damage sustained by the hull would have been enough to cause her to break up in the heavy weather. The postulation is that the vessel became disoriented at some point due to the weather and accidentally touched a shoal near Caribou Island. However, dive surveys on the shoal showed no sign of a recent contact. The third hypothesis is that Edmund Fitzgerald suffered some sort of structural failure at the surface due to modifications to her winter load line. Effectively, she was able to load to a deeper draft than she had originally been designed for. That original design was already highly constrained by the fact that she needed to be a Seaway Max vessel, so it's not like there was lots of residual strength left for increasing that winter load line. This means that when she met heavy weather, the bending and flexing of the hull was just too much, so she broke apart. The next hypothesis is that Edmund Fitzgerald foundered because her hatches were not secured properly. The idea has come about because surveys of the wreck show that some of the hatch clamps are undamaged and in the open position. Without properly secured hatch clamps, water would progressively get into the massive cargo holds and fill all that empty space that was needed to keep the dense ore cargo afloat. Over time, she would sink lower and lower until eventually she would slip beneath the waves. This hypothesis is disputed by surveys which show that the hatch covers have clearly buckled due to external forces, making progressive flooding due to unsecured hatch clamps less likely. Another hypothesis is that the wind and seas were simply too much for the Edmund Fitzgerald. On the night she went down, the wind and consequently the waves were from a northwesterly direction. This gave them a long fetch, increasing their height. As Edmund Fitzgerald was heading in a southeasterly direction, the waves would have been coming from right astern of her, potentially leading to very heavy rolling. It could be that on one of those rolls, she just went over too far and never came back up. Leading on from that, we then have the Three Sisters hypothesis. It's reported that a group of three rogue waves were in the vicinity of Edmund Fitzgerald at the time that she went down. As each wave struck, it's thought that there was not enough time for the previous wave to have drained from the deck, so she just ended up being swamped. As for me, I think it was actually a combination of a number of different hypotheses that led to her sinking. I don't know if you remember another video I made about the MV Derbyshire, but it has so many similarities to this that I think it's a safe bet to also use that to help explain what happened here. The change in load line would have led to her sitting lower in the water and being less capable of riding out extreme weather. When the waves started to increase, water on the deck could have dislodged ventilation covers, leading to water ingress into the ballast tanks. That same water could have progressively found its way into the cargo holds through the unsecured hatches. As the weight of the water increased, the stress and strain would have led to the ship flexing more than usual, adding so much force to the deck that the railings could have come apart. Over time, she would have sat lower and lower in the water, leading to more and more water being shipped over the deck. 
at some point, either from a particularly large wave or from a parametric roll due to the following seas, there would have been a single failure of one of our forward hatches, allowing that cargo hold to flood completely. Remember, there was loads of empty space due to the density of our cargo. The additional weight of the flood water would have dragged the bow further down with subsequent waves collapsing further hatch covers. Given that the vessel sank in only 160 meters of water, the bow could have touched the lake bed while the stern was still afloat. The shock sent through the hull would have been the final straw, breaking the weakened midsection. The forward end would have remained in place while the stern could have swirled around a bit, scattering a couple of holds of cargo across the wreck's site until coming to rest in the position it was eventually found. As I say though, it's impossible to know the truth, so all we can do is piece together things and make a best guess as to what really happened on that night. If you like this video, I recommend you next watch my video about the Derbyshire, which was a massive bulker that went down in similar circumstances in a typhoon near Japan in 1980. Otherwise, community members might want to check out the director's commentary of this video, which has just gone live in the community for second mates and above. If you're not yet a member, just check the description to find out more.